We've talked a lot about a defensive tackle need for the Cincinnati Bengals. How have things changed and what should their strategy be in this 2024 draft? You are Locked On Bengals, your daily Cincinnati Bengals podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, Bengals fans, and welcome to another episode of the Lockdown Bengals Podcast. I'm your host, Jake Lisko. He's your host, James Rapine. We're the Lockdown Bengals Podcast on the Lockdown Podcast Network, covering your team every day. We're on YouTube. We're everywhere you get your podcasts. If you're looking to stay up to date on all things Bengals as we lead into this draft and become an everydayer, perhaps, we appreciate all you everydayers out there. Shout out or make us your first listen. Well, hit the subscribe button because that makes those things very easy. Today, we start with a discussion on Tavondre Sweat, who was arrested in Texas, unfortunately, a couple weeks before the draft, less than a week after he visited with the Cincinnati Bengals, a guy we've talked about as a potential target for the Bengals, certainly the top of the nose tackle class by consensus and how that might impact things and how that might change what the Bengals need to do in their approach to the, the defensive tackle position in the 2024 NFL draft. We're also going to cover a couple small corner notes, cornerback notes at the end of the show. But James, let's start with Tavondre Sweat, arrested for DWI. That's all we know at this point. We have no details beyond the fact that he was arrested. But for a team that has so highly valued character in the draft under Zach Taylor, it is impossible to dismiss that impact on the Cincinnati Bengals. No, don't dismiss it. It it guarantees that they're not going to pick him in round two, for sure, like 100%. And I, I think he's probably off of their day two board altogether. Look, I, I think Tavondre Sweat was thought of very highly because for good reason, how how strong he is as a prospect, the size, the his ability to generate some pass rush at that size, his foot speed, all of these traits. But there were questions already about his his weight and how it would translate and, and if he was dedicated. And we don't know how the the meeting went with the Bengals. But I've been really hesitant to say, oh, we have, well, they'll take him at 49. I'm just, I wasn't there, haven't been there. And now I can just say there, there's no way. They, they may have, I think they're more likely to have him off of their draft board completely than to have him on their realistic targets at 49 and that doesn't mean that's the case they have six day three picks they have four in round six and seven and so i, I think that there are scenarios or there are scenarios where tavandre sweat still is a bengal but i i'm not going to say that it's likely or that they're about to get great value like some instantly went there like oh well now they can get him another round later they can get him in round three because they thought that they would have to take him in round two. And that's just not going to happen because the tiebreaker is already going to the other opponent. Let's say they have a, the same grade player-wise or Sweat even has a better grade because he probably does than some of these other defensive tackles from the film and what he did at the Senior Bowl and all of those things. That's great. It took a major hit, though, because you had the the weight stuff, the weight questions. And now you have this an off the field thing and some will dismiss it and that's fine, but you're right. We don't have any information, but what we do know is that 17, 18 days, maybe 19, if he's drafted on day two days before the biggest day of his professional life, he makes a huge mistake. That doesn't mean that he can't recover from it and be a good NFL player, but that does hurt his value when you're trying to be one of the elite of the elite at your position, at your job, it would hurt anybody's value. Uh, mine, yours, anybody's, if that happened. And so it's unfortunate, and uh, I, I would be surprised if the Bengals drafted him on day two. Yeah, I think the it's a compounding issue, right? One, it's a nose tackle. Two, there are the, the weight questions, 366. At the combine, still tested, tested like a nose tackle, weighed like a nose tackle, one of the biggest nose tackles to, to ever weigh in at the combine. So, so it's not like there was this clean profile to start with. 
the Bengals bring him in presumably to to get some answers on some of those questions, to spend some extra time with him. They, they met with him at the combine. They they bring him in for a closer look, but then he doesn't even make it a week from that visit before making a mistake. And maybe we later learn that he wasn't actually driving while influenced, driving while impaired. Sure. Maybe we later learn that this is a bogus charge. Who knows? We we don't know what's going to happen, but looking at him walking out of that jail and there's a video of it, a reporter followed him to his car and was asking him and his lawyer questions. He got a towel over his head, wearing a mask, trying not to be identified. Didn't want to answer questions released on bond. It's hard to speculate either way is all I'm saying. And when you're arrested for a DWI in April as a draft prospect, it generally does negative things to your draft stock. Now, would a team potentially overlook this and still pick him late second round, early third round? There are teams out there that I think would do it, but I, I don't think that the Bengals are one of those teams right now, to your point, James. Even though there's this, we've talked about it, there, there's this need for a bigger-bodied interior defensive lineman, ideally with some upside, and he was that guy in this draft. The, the most mm -hmm. demonstrable upside for any sure. of the nose tackles that we're going to talk about. And we're going to talk about some of the nose tackles because the Bengals have, have had contact either with, you know, official 30 visits or pro days or combine visits with so many of these guys. They're in that market and that hasn't changed. But, you know, yesterday I, I said during our mock draft Monday that I would consider, I would still consider Devon Vase went in the second round based on film and the profile and, Without access to complete information, obviously, that probably changes for me, certainly for the Bengals after that arrest. Well, it, it changes because, and you're seeing this now, like I, I think you're talking about reputable sources here. Dane Brugler, the Beast comes out in two days. It comes out Wednesday. Can't wait. We're yeah. going to refer to the Beast a ton, which is his draft guide for those wondering. And he's talking about how teams were concerned about the partying and part of the top 30 visits were mm -hmm. that. Was him talking about that, and 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 so it wasn't just the fact that he's three sixty six and probably can't play in the NFL at three sixty six and be effective like teams are going to want him to be, and probably needs to be three fifty, even if he moves light on his feet and feels good at three sixty. All of those things, and, and so that there's a bunch of things, and looking at the Bengals and what they've done in recent years, it's not just oh this guy got a DUI he's off their board. It's not that simple, and that's why when some say oh well. They drafted Joe Mixon, or they did this, or they did that, and they mentioned all of these things on social media. Yeah, those were completely different scenarios, completely different circumstances, and I'm not going to go down the path of each one, but where where Sweat is on the board, he's he's farther down today than he was three days ago. It's just the reality of, of what the Bengals are looking at and what Tavondre Sweat is looking at. Doesn't matter if he responds the right way, he's still going to have a hell of a career because he's got talent. And I get why people are intrigued by that. I would be surprised if the Bengals drafted him because I think there will be a team, to your point, that falls in love with that talent and takes him earlier than the Bengals are willing to. Maybe not. Maybe they they snag him at pick 97. But I, I do think that it will uh, he, he will cause him to fall some and another team will take him. And, and like I said, we'll learn more about this, presumably, or at least NFL teams will. Whatever team drafts him will certainly know more about this than we do. But... To your point, great Dane Brugler tweet on the topic that he was talking with teams about it. I had missed that, so that's a good one to point out. The other thing about comparisons to players the Bengals have taken in the past, under Zach Taylor, it's really just Jackson Carmen for guys that we know of, Like, right? Am I, am I forgetting somebody? It's really just Jackson Carmen that we know of where there was an incident uh, dur during his college days that needed to be considered. Besides that, they're drafting team captain types, not not the kind of guys that they took chances on with Marvin Lewis. And I don't think everybody in the building was all in on Jackson Carmen either. Just no, we know that for sure. Yeah. <laughs> I was trying uh, to put it very light. Putting it very light. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't a Carmen topic, and I, no. I don't want to just continue to, to pile on them. No, that, that wasn't my point of bringing it up. No, it was just to say that that's the only one. Like, I was just looking at the last few years of the Bengals drafting. They haven't done it since Zach Taylor came along. Yeah, I, I, no, I agree with you. I just, and I wasn't saying, I wasn't saying you were, I just didn't want to. Yeah. If I continued to go, I felt <laughs> like I would, but 
Regardless, maybe it's Jackson Carmen at nose tackle. The Bengals certainly need defensive tackle help. We will discuss the plan in the 2024 NFL draft when it comes to defensive tackle coming up next. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. A lot of us spend our lives wishing we had more time. The question is, time for what? If time was unlimited, how would you use it? The best way to squeeze that special thing into your schedule is to know what's important to you and to make it a priority. Maybe you want to get in daily walks. Maybe you want to get in lifts, runs. Jim Jake, yeah, Jake Lisko, been prioritizing the gym, gets to the gym regularly. And if you're trying to figure out what you want to prioritize, what is important to you, therapy can help you do just that. And if you've ever thought about starting therapy or you're thinking about starting therapy now, give BetterHelp a try because it's entirely online. It's convenient. It's going to fit your schedule, whether you're an NFL player listening to this or potential NFL player listening to this with the NFL draft just over two weeks away, or you're the biggest Bengals fan in the world and you travel for work, BetterHelp will fit your schedule. All you have to do to get started is fill out a brief questionnaire and get matched with a licensed therapist, and you can switch therapists at any time. Learn to make time for what makes you happy with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash on to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash on. We've talked a lot about defensive tackles in this 2024 draft class, and we know that the Bengals have done their homework throughout mm -hmm. the class. They met with Johnny Newton and Byron Murphy at the Combine. Reportedly, Ruka Rovero had an informal meeting with the Cincinnati Bengals at the Ro -ro -ro. Combine. Yep. The Bengals had a presence at LSU's Pro Day where Makai Wingo and Mason Smith both worked out, and they also hosted Mason Smith. Tavondre Sweat was in for one of those official 30 visits. They had coaches at Jordan Jefferson's Pro Day, also at LSU. They had a coach at Christian Boyd's Pro Day at Northern Iowa, where he might actually be testing along with Cooper DeGene at uh, that individual yeah, workout happening. Yeah. Uh, as we record this episode, where we just got some measurables for DeGene, I haven't seen anything on Boyd, but they, they hosted McKinley Jackson. They had coaches at Evan Anderson's Pro Day at FAU, at Auburn, where... Marcus Harris was working out. They hosted Justin Rogers and had a coach again at the Auburn Pro Day where, where Rogers also worked out. The Bengals have had contact with guys throughout this draft, both from the top end to the day three kind of targets and have done a lot of work on bigger body types. Every nose tackle in this draft, give or take, the Bengals have had some sort of recorded, reported contact with. Yeah, because it, it's up to them to find that nose tackle, that big body nose tackle, regardless of who they take. I think regardless of who they take, and they'll probably address the defensive line like we have in mocks on day two. If they don't do it in round one, they'll do it on day two. But the big body nose tackle types, I think they'll use one of those six day three picks. And their, their job is to figure out which guys are going to matter. Will Evan Anderson be able to project from where he is at a small school to the NFL in the AFC North, will it work? Because he's got size, 350 plus pounds. He was making plays. He was lining up at nodes. He's doing all of those things. Like maybe they could find a diamond in the rough there. And maybe they all take right, What him. was the weight you said for Evan Anderson? Isn't he 350? I've got him at 319. Ooh, maybe I looked at it wrong. Maybe I'm looking at wrong information too. Just want to make sure we got the right number there. On Evan Anderson in particular. No, here, I'll check. I'm probably wrong. I might have seen it wrong. Uh, Point stands that... Yeah, 319 is probably right. I just saw it on a site here. Why did I say 350? The only guy we have over 350, period, at, at defensive tackle is is Sweat. For what? Okay. So, regardless, <laughs> Evan Anderson. Yeah. And that makes sense. DJ Reader played at like 320, just to give yeah. people an idea. Like, it's not like he was 350. Like, that's what's crazy about Sweat, by the way. 366 is not. That's huge. It's not normal. No, it's, it's rare. It's rare, rare size. Yeah. It's huge. And, it, you know, especially at six, it's not like he's 6'8", like Orlando or, or Trent Brown. And mm -hmm. so makes it crazier. But let's say they take, let's say they take Chris Jenkins, right? Who I like. I, I think they already had him ahead of Sweat anyways. But who knows? Well, let's say they take him. That's not going to necessarily stop them from taking a, a another nose, an Evan Anderson late. 
or maybe they take Braden Fisk or Ruka Row 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 or uh, Michael Hall Jr. Like any of these guys that you're looking at, I think they could still double down really easy and, and take an Evan Anderson or, or take any of the other guys that they've met with and talked to. I think the way this kind of looks to me right now is I, I still think first round their plan A is offensive tackle. I think that in most scenarios, that's their plan A. You could talk about Brock Bowers. You could talk about some scenarios where it's Newton or Murphy. Sure. You could talk about Quinion Mitchell as a potential option. But I think plan A is still probably offensive tackle. Yep. I agree so, with that. It, by the way, my offensive tackle board, just teasing future episodes, is uh-huh. starting to take real shape, Jake Lisko. Okay. Real shape. Excellent. Something yeah, we will discuss because okay. we're going to talk yeah. about predictive stuff and what positions we think are most likely for each round. And we'll talk about each position group for sure in, in greater depth. And maybe we're starting that today with defensive tackle a little bit, although I'm sure, again, we'll we'll revisit between now and the draft. But again, first round to me seems like plan A is offensive tackle, regardless yep. of anything else happening. You get to the second and third round and, and you're going to see a mix of uh, we've talked about this a lot. Some fans don't seem to like it. I think there's a day two wide receiver coming. There's a chance that it doesn't line up for the guys they like versus where they're picking. But I think that there's going to be, what, five-ish first-round receivers. There's going to be some receivers at the top of the second round, and there are going to be some tempting receivers as they're looking for a replacement for T. Higgins long-term in the second round. And they've done this plenty of times historically. It's not unusual for the Bengals to go receiver on day two. But in addition to that, I think – the the three tech type of defensive tackle would be a day two target if they wanted to double dip a defensive tackle in particular the pass rusher the versatile piece who can line up in multiple spots i think that's what they're looking at at day two and then we talked about this i think last week we discussed where do where do nose tackles get picked is generally the third day of the draft so mckinley jackson maybe at 97 maybe in the fourth round evan anderson certainly a day three target uh, the Justin Rogers of the world, day three targets. And they've talked to all these guys to get a feel. Evan Anderson, I, I mentioned, they talked to these guys to get a feel for which of them they're going to be most comfortable with picking on day three. And you look at the guys that are playing the most nose tackle snaps in the NFL. One, it's not very many. We discussed this. I think it was Friday last week. And two, they're they're picked on day three. They're not having a huge impact. They're not playing a ton of snaps. You need a guy that's going to come play 100, 150 snaps of nose tackle. And, and you're not using a premium pick on that unless they're a freak athletically. And those guys aren't in this draft. Yep. And so identifying, finding and identifying the guy that can come in and give you that and compliment what you have. I, that's, that's why they'll probably take two, two defensive tackles and they should it, to add some depth there. Even if they do sign a veteran, I still think – we're about to get into that the end of the veteran window. I think this is kind of the week where if they're going to add someone, they'll do it, whether it's corner, or defensive tackle, or whatever the case is. And we're obviously talking about those two spots today. So bring those up. But the double dip is very real. I think at multiple positions, offensive line, defensive line, I could go on and on. Don't make me answer about receiver. People won't like the answer there about the possible double dip. But certainly – at defensive tackle, I, I could see it. And in defensive line, you could see three guys overall, but certainly two tackles, and in one being the the bigger body nose type. And who knows? Maybe it's three hundred and fifty pound Evan Anderson. Maybe he'll get some uh, some protein in his his diet, that Jake Lisko diet, and add thirty one pounds. I'm kidding, Evan. I'm kidding. I do. Uh, I am rooting for you, though. Hopefully, you're you're here in Cincinnati and and you crush it, so we can make fun of the fact that I said you were three hundred and fifty pounds during the pre draft process. I think you need a lot more than protein to add 30 pounds when you're already 320. Him and Chris, him and Charlie Jones can get on the, the same diet so they can put on a little weight. <laughs> uh, that'll be interesting, Charlie Jones. Not that we're going to discuss that today, but it will be interesting to see how Charlie Jones shows up to uh, the offseason He's gonna program be this year. Yoked. Yoked. Watch. So, pass rushing type, defensive tackle day two, nose yep. tackle type day three. Or maybe just a couple of day three defensive tackles. That's my thought on the Bengals' twenty-four draft strategy. And Jink, Chris Jenkins gives you a little bit of both, you know. But really uh, good run defender, but yeah. not a, not a traditional nose tackle body. Just just south of three hundred, but perhaps could get there. He's only six two, six three, so he's a little bit shorter for that that weight. 
Yeah, he's he's three hundred. Basically, he's two ninety nine. I think. Yeah. But yeah, I think uh, it, certainly someone to eye does give you a little pass rush as well. Um, but if you're you're thinking day two, that's a name we haven't really talked a, a ton about. But speaking of a name we haven't talked a ton about, there's an Iowa cornerback that tested really well at his pro day. We'll get to him coming up next. Today's show is brought to you by Game Time. Game Time is the app that you need because if you're going to the Reds game and the Reds, well, they need your help because they play the Brewers. It's their first National League Central Series of the season. It's at Great American Ballpark. And if you don't have tickets, but you want to go, well, Game Time is the place to go. You download the Game Time app and you can find the tickets that are going to be perfect for you. There's no hidden fees. You can see the view directly from your seat. And so you know exactly what you're getting. And it's last minute. So maybe you want to pop into Holy Grail uh, on the banks, go to Condado, have a few drinks, and then you just decide to go to the Reds game. Well, just download the Game Time app now so you're ready to go and you can get those tickets because they have last minute tickets, they have flash deals, they have zone deals. And right now you're going to get $20 off with your first purchase at Game Time and in the Game Time app. All you have to do is download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code locked on NFL for $20 off your first purchase. Again, that's $20 off with code locked on NFL, L O C K E D. O-N-N-F-L. Download the Game Time app today. Last-minute tickets. Lowest price. Guaranteed. Cooper DeGene finally did his testing at yeah, an man. individual workout where I am going to see if we can also find whether our defensive tackle Boyd from Northern Iowa tested. But the Bengals have had some interest in corners in this draft cycle. Not necessarily DeGene individually. We just haven't talked about him very much. But perhaps in the first round conversation, kind of dismissed it in Mock Draft Monday yesterday, James, if he's seen as just a versatile defensive back that may need to play safety in the NFL because, as we discussed, the Bengals have that. But if he is a true corner, which perhaps the, the testing indicates he, he should be thought of more as a true corner where he tested really well, Perhaps he should be more in that first round conversation along with Quinion Mitchell and Quin Quinion Mitchell and Terry and Arnold. But the, the two corners that the Bengals have had contact with are Mike Sandrastrill and Dwight McLuthern. And this is a vintage Justin M story over the draft network where Mc McLuthern specifically called out the Cincinnati Bengals as a team that expressed some interest in him after his pro day. Yeah, and not shocked that the Bengals are looking at day three you, you got to leave no stone unturned when it comes to day three and McLaughlin probably in that round five round six range where you could see one of those late round picks going towards a cornerback and going towards someone like him who he's had seven interceptions over the past couple of years former LSU player transferred to Arkansas didn't test well at all <laughs> the, the the jumps he's got those let's go jumps but uh you know he's Got a shot because of the ball skills, I think, to to be a good player in the NFL, be a quality day three pick. And uh, real quick, just as we're recording here, Tom Pelletier reporting that Tavondre Sweat flying to Tennessee for a visit with the Titans will also visit the Seahawks later this week. So those teams almost get the benefit of meeting with him after this and talking about it. And uh, so that's the downside to meeting with him early. Not that the Bengals can't get that information. I'm sure Zach can call Brian. And get it but still just worth uh pointing out but uh I, I could totally see getting back to cornerback i could totally see a day three corner especially if they pass on one and there are very real scenarios where they don't get a corner in the first two days and, and if that's the case i do think that they'll add one that they can develop over time and in, in, on day three yeah i think that we've discussed corner quite a bit for a reason and the the interest in a day three corner would make sense. It's something that we've seen a lot in the Bengals history as well. John Sheeran did a good job of writing about this at A to Z Sports, where he covers the Bengals, where you know, Marvin Lewis era, a lot of first round corners, Zach Taylor so far, second round corners and and late corners when there hasn't been an opportunity to necessarily always pick them early. McLaughlin could be the latest day three corner for the Cincinnati Bengals, a team that has a front office that clearly values corner. That has been constant between the two recent coaching regimes in Cincinnati. McLaughlin was quoted by Justin Mello in an interview at thedraftnetwork.com saying, he met with the Cincinnati Bengals cornerbacks coach after his pro day. The Bengals sounded very interested in him. 
We'll see what happens. Just sorting through the schedule, be taking some visits. But specifically, when he was asked about teams that he met with in the pre-draft process in person or virtually, called out the Bengals, said the Bengals sounded interested. And that is why we're talking about Dwight McLaughlin. Didn't test great, like like you said, James, but has some interesting tape. And, and there's presumably a reason the Bengals did express interest. Maybe it's because they think he's a priority free agent type, or maybe they think he's a, a you know, round six, round seven target, but uh, an interesting one to note because you got that quote. Yeah, for sure. And it's, this is one of the things pre-draft wise, this is random. You don't know it's coming, but that I like about the Bengals is, is their coaches are more involved than others, than other staffs. And so to have your coaches work with these guys and then to know that the input is going to be there, I think that's how you identify these late round guys that could make an impact. Like I think DJ Ivy, I don't know what's going to happen. I know he's rehabbing, he's training, he's doing everything he can to get back. What a heck of a find that was, wasn't it? I mean, that makes a, a ton of sense. Marcus Bailey, that was a really good find late and obvious reasons why Marcus fell, but DJ Ivy looked like a real player and, and hopefully he can recover from the ACL and be a real player this year. But I, finding those type of guys, it's, it's important. And, and even if it's contributors and not stars, finding those guys on day three really helps. Yeah, and they need to continue to find contributors on day three. It's nice this year that they have the four top 100 picks and maybe they end up packaging some picks to make it five. Wouldn't be opposed to to that at all because they have probably more late round picks than they need. But when you have the late round picks, finding contributors is something they've been able to do lately and, and would be useful to see that continue. Uh, last note for me, James, for this episode is, is back to Christian Boyd. I was able to find his pro day numbers as we were discussing corner and build a custom RAS card for him here. And so we can, we can talk about the fact that he uh, weighed in and, and measured like a nose tackle 31 and a half inch arms at six, two and a half, uh, six, two and, and three quarters, maybe 325 for the weight. So really a, a nose tackle body through and through had poor agility testing, which is normal for that weight. He had uh, a pretty poor broad jump, but a pretty good vertical for a guy that weighs 325 at a 28 and a half inches, which is 53rd percentile for defensive tackles, which for 325, that tells you that there's definitely some explosion in yeah. that body. But again, doesn't change really anything about his evaluation. Looks like a nose tackle, tests like a nose tackle. Nose tackles are generally going to test worst worse than three tech kind of bodies and unless they test like freaks like dexter lawrence or uh jalen carter they're going to get picked in the third third day of the draft and i think that remains true for small school big body nose tackle body christian boyd yeah i agree with you but it's another option and that's some of these guys are going to hit and it's up to the bengals to find the right ones and, and the right guys and can they find the next DJ reader, right? Maybe not, but can they find the next contributing nose tackle? Yeah. Reader once upon a time was a fourth rounder. So hopefully they, they can get it done and find the right guys. And one of the big things that DJ had going for him as a prospect was he was very productive. And so that is one thing to look at when you have, you know, athleticism that typically for nose tackles is going to be in the red when you're looking at the RAS card. When, when they have a lot of production to go along with that, that's generally a, a pretty good sign. And so like McKinley Jackson looks like the top producer for these nose tackle bodies that, that I see, excluding Tavondre Sweat at this point for a day three option. So, uh, hey, maybe McKinley Jackson is, is the fourth round target if you're looking for that kind of guy. Or maybe he's just not in the draft because DJ Reader is a very, very rare player. That's going to do it for this episode of the Locked On Bengals podcast. More to talk about as we continue to gear up for the 2024 NFL Draft. That'll come as we continue our episodes this week. Until next time, thanks for listening. Hootay, and have a good one.